So now it's time for Elora Hardy. Just gonna make a, a quick introduction. Uh, she's the founder and creative director of Ibuku, where design begins with the principles of nature, employing out the natural tendencies of bamboo, stone, water, and topography to build over 200 homes, hotels, schools, and workspaces. Hilora was raised in Bali, inspired by highly skilled craftsmen who shaped dreams into reality. As a child, Hilora ran through Bali's natural wonder. She went to, on to study art and design after painting Donna Karen's runaway dresses by hand and leading DKNY prints and patterns. She sought to apply that design sense to ecologically uplifting, uplifting spaces. Hibuku's works have won multiple awards and have been featured on Apple TV Plus, docuseries Home. Architectural Digest, Hell Decor, Vogue, Tatler, London Design Week, CNN, and the BBC. She was named an Architectural Digest Innovator at the AD100 list and was named Honorary Royal Designer for Industry in 2019. So, Hilara, quite a big introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Hi. So, very nice to have you here. We'll now let you do your presentation and do some questions after. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm just sharing the screen so that you can see my presentation today. So I lead the team at Ibuku and everything that we do grew out of the choice to use bamboo. Over the past couple decades, we have created over 200 unique structures, many of them in Bali and now more and more overseas. And in the absence of a tried and true vocabulary of bamboo architecture, we're going far beyond vernacular techniques and we've had to invent our own rules. What we've learned more than anything is to listen, not so much for what we personally wanna create, but to understand what people need in the world today and also what this material wants to become in our hands. But first to work with it, we had to set a whole new industry in motion. Here in Bali, Bamboo Pure harvests, treats, treats, processes, and builds most of our projects. And that is what has allowed us to build permanent structures. And honestly, none of us feel like experts yet. But what lifts my heart is that Bamboo, it really lets us reach for bounty in a world more often aspiring to scarce luxuries. And in the sustainability conversation, Bamboo's abundance, it lets us just be good instead of straining to be a little less bad. And as my dad, John Hardy said, when he and Cynthia chose bamboo for green school, it's just amazing that we can really promise bamboo to the kids. The campus of green school, it is a stand for the fact that we can grow enough bamboo for everyone. There can be enough for everyone in the future. Now green school, it really transcended the practical needs of a, of a campus and it captured hearts through a combination of human ingenuity and design, and of also of letting the strength and grace of bamboo itself shine through. And one thing that's really clear is that this material is a marvel of engineering. Its tensile strength can be, can be compared with steel, its compressive strength with concrete, and overall an amazing engineer called Neil Thomas of Atelier One, he says that it's most similar to carbon fiber so we have very often used these strong compressive poles intact. And here in this drawing, it's one of our communication tools used between the designers and the builders to show the arrangement of how these poles intersect. And I want to acknowledge that every material has its strengths and also its limitations and vulnerabilities. So we've gotten more and more into testing. Strength testing really lets us know the limits of the material because we need to respect the limits of the material we work with and also push and play with them to create new innovations. And whether on site or here at our studio or at home where we've had to work sometimes in the past few years, we've learned that we have to be flexible like bamboo. We have to be ready to unlearn our training sometimes to reinvent our own rules. And it really doesn't work to apply thinking from other materials. Not many of the ways that we work with wood or steel or anything else can be just applied to bamboo. This isn't an easy material to work with. First, we've really had to understand it. These are curving, tapering, hollow poles, 
no two poles alike, no straight lines here. And we aspire for the results of our work to look effortless, but don't let that deceive you. This is a challenging orchestration of a variety of individual unique pieces, each with their own personality, character, flaws, and sketching. Design is often based on sketching and I have a fine arts background personally. And I just love to let my imagination come free on the page. But just drawing, it isn't the way to create three-dimensional results. It's essential that we keep thinking in three dimensions. Increasingly, we get into 3D using CAD, Rhino, Grasshopper. And while we do love technology, this really can't all happen at a flat desk or on a flat paper or even on a flat screen with three dimensions behind it. How do we anchor ourselves back into reality? Often, we design onto these terraced contours of the landscape. Each of the layers in this model, it's cut by hand, then pasted together, covered with sawdust and green pigment to make this terrace. This is approaching three-dimensional in the way that we need it to be. What we love is to be on site, but lately we've had to adjust this too, so that we're able to do work in other parts of the world. How do we get ourselves grounded in a space where we can't be? So we're looking at technology again. How can it help bridge this? How can we ground, up, ground ourselves back into reality in a studio as well? Well, as we develop the structures, the model making process is where so much of our design thinking happens. We've got to get our minds into the site, inside of the model. And on site, that model, it's not just for the design process, it's not for the clients, appreciation. It's a structural model and on site, once complete, that model rules every stick of the model. It literally represents a column of the house. That craftsman is using a tiny scale ruler to measure each pole and each piece of bamboo has been hand whittled to approximate the scale of the pole in real life. Each of those poles being unique and its own dimension within a range of tolerance that we've prescribed in the design. And there's this moment in the construction process when the structure, it just looks like the model. It's an amazing moment. It's this beautiful sculptural model that we've worked hard on and crafted. We've fallen in love with it. Suddenly it's realized at full scale as a building. And then the roof goes on and the walls go in and the skin of the building, and the windows flesh it out. And that's even more important. But here in this moment, in this model, look closely. That single craftsman in the center of the frame he is lifting a structural pole into place. And then it's his responsibility, whatever the drawing says, it's his responsibility to make sure that that curving, tapering, unique pole intersects at several points along the 16 meter length so that it can do its job. That's not the kind of responsibility that we normally put, that it is normally put in the hands of a construction worker. Now, every piece of bamboo in the buildings that we've been creating in Bali require a craftsmanship, craftsman's care and attention and selection. And also increasingly support from machinery and technology to lift it into place, to document it, to analyze it, to communicate with the engineer, especially to sign off on it. Now this, this is the arc. It's a gymnasium and a wellness space at the Green School in Bali. It features these pole built arches and also the splits that bind them together. So as much as it might look like the, the arches are holding up this structure, they are not strong enough to support the building without the interconnection with the surface in between. So it's a grid shell structure where the surface is what provides the strength. So this is about connecting hands with machines, connecting artistry with technology, I think this is the balance that we need for the future. And the results, they're beautiful and inspiring as well as being technically precise. And as we develop technologies and engineering systems that don't require craftsmanship, which is very important so that we can have a sense of <laughs> so that we can have a sense of being able to replicate and create buildings at scale without relying on craftsmanship, the potential it broadens. Imagine 
with this material, we could grow what you need to build an entire home or entire skyscraper or an entire city within the four years that it takes one bamboo pole to go from a shoot to a mature timber. That's an extraordinarily fast pace when we're talking about regenerating. So we've had the chance to just build on the most beautiful landscapes, especially here in Bali, and now in other parts of the world too, in Central America, in Europe. And what we found by appreciating those, those beautiful sites um, is that we're seeking a sense of continuity. Buildings on these terraced ravines in the jungle, they just can't be rectangular. So we find ways to curve and nestle our spaces into the contour of the site. We're seeking a sense that the building belongs there, almost that it could have grown there. And I think that when a building sits in its location in a way that feels aligned, it reminds us humans that we also belong in nature, that we are part of the world. And inside of a building, once you've created that conversation, we consider how to keep that thinking through to the details. This is a structure that's made of bundled splits. And there, that is a laminate bamboo door frame. We're getting away from the pole in some cases, slicing the pole up to different levels of refinement and bending it more and more, unleashing its flexibility and bending it to our whim and our imaginations. For the interiors, we really consider how to keep the continuity in our thinking. Inside that curving house on the terrace step of a river, it needs terraced steps into the bedroom. And it needs a door that almost feels like a portal into that new and different world than we're used to. And sometimes we're designing in a box. We were asked to turn this box in Hong Kong, concrete third story structure. We were asked to transform it into a Balinese landscape to become a restaurant as a bespoke interior design project. And so we found ways to bring comfort and closeness and texture and ultimately to bring nature into this space. And more and more, we're bringing bamboo overseas. This is the concept sketch for a sculptural volcano. And when it was realized inside of the techie warehouse space in Las Vegas, it's called Area 15. It was a amazing juxtaposition and also intrusion into this really artificial, technical, colorful space, a moment of nature, and they called it the sanctuary. And we also had the opportunity to create the master plan for another school in Mexico, looking at how we can nestle ourselves into that jungle. And what we're listening for is for the power of space. How can we create spaces that feel like they're holding us? And when that works, what does it make possible within us? This, this is a tree house in Panama, local bamboo from nearby Costa Rica, built up on tall wooden stilts. It's weathered, reclaimed timber from the Panama Canal from 100 years ago. And there's an obvious sustainable bounty to bamboo that unleashes this sense of play and possibility and goodness and future credibility. And that's a really important part of the conversation. That's where we started our conversation in design. But on a daily moment to moment level, we need to apply whatever finds the most comfort for a home. And the right balance and sense of connection and also protection. We're human, soft creatures in the wilds of nature. We need to be protected and sheltered. We need spaces that enclose while still being in nature. So more and more, we're using what we've learned from bamboo and incorporating other natural materials. This terrazzo floor gives the warm bamboo of the house a cool, refreshing element. And it's that new palette that's opened up a whole other world of experience and also of design adventure. And we still love our bamboo. These columns, they're familiar. The form is friendly. They almost invite us to lean against them and it's like leaning against the arm of your friend. And I wonder if generally natural materials in their uniqueness, that they perhaps they give us permission to be our own imperfect selves. I wonder, can the room that we are in help us to 
forgive and love ourselves. Because humans, us humans and other natural things, we really aren't made up of very many right angles or very many straight lines. We are creatures of curve and texture and softness. And as we think about the world and the future, change is inev inevitable and our impact on the world and on each other is inevitable. So what I wonder is, is it possible even to make our impact positive so that human presence can really add value to a place? This, in this sketch, this is a real tree house. It's a room within a tree house, within a tree. And honestly, what business do we have being up in a tree, making a house in a tree? What an interruption to its own existence. I don't know. Well, what it raised for us is the challenge of creating something that felt it deserved to be in the tree, worthwhile to interrupt the tree. And what it's done and what it's given me and other people that experience it access to is a sense of inspiration and excitement in relationship with the tree. More of a sense of respect and admiration being up close in the tree um, in a way that I think I had really overlooked before. And so starting that conversation really brings up how can we live with nature as part of nature? Aren't we after all part of nature ourselves? And always it comes back to looking for how we want to be held by the spaces around us. And just as we wear our clothes, just as we relate to the forms around us, these layers of structure and buildings, they inform our sense of self. I feel we adopt them to become layers of ourselves. And so as we want to journey and adventure, once we have a sense of security at home, inevitably humans seek out adventure. And of course, we also need that sense of shelter. But more than anything, wherever we are, we wish to have a sense of belonging there. And at the moment, over the past few years, wherever we are, wherever we go, we do have to ask ourselves a question of what would it feel like to be stuck there, to be isolating or quarantining there? And with less freedom to choose where we are and to go where we want to go and see who we want to see, I think we're more in touch than ever with the power of space. So this, this little room at Bambuinda is called the Copper House. And this is what you call a love nest. It's a place for engagements, anniversaries. It's said even a number of conceptions. That's the power of space. And when you create, when you have the opportunity and the privilege to create a new space, you have the chance to reinvent it. A bedroom, while still being a square mattress, rectangular mattress, it doesn't have to just be a bed in a box. Imagine waking up here. And have you ever woken up from a nap in a park, looking up at a tree, looking up into the branches and the way that the light settles? And that's what we're looking for from this bedroom. And I wonder if we've forgotten what we really need and crave in the spaces around us that we have in the natural world and less so in the world that we've built. Just more in touch than ever with the power of space. This is that tree house I was mentioning, suspended among three giant trees, creating an interruption, yes, but also a new sense of possibility. And as we create these spaces, we need to continue to follow a new path. This, the gym I mentioned earlier at Green School, it's structured in a way that resembles the human rib cage and the fascia that holds our rib cages together. And the structure is kind of more like a body than most buildings that we've seen. And that familiarity, I think it helps us feel we belong inside of it, that we can be self-expressed inside of it. And so we're translating our design thinking into many different realms. This is a material, mixed material house, only a little bit of bamboo in the roots, but we're expressing each texture and utility and letting each material allow another to shine. We also seek to remember tradition, to bring some of the past into the future, reinterpreting it, reimagining it, expressing the materiality and also the contextuality of the space. And we're always looking for the chance 
to reconnect with nature just the right amount to be sheltered and protected enough while also having the opportunity to connect. Because we humans, we've really spent forever building to protect ourselves. But I believe that now as a default, we have really come to shut ourselves off. I wonder, can the texture of a floor, can it ground us? Can it give us a sense of closeness? In some places, protection and defensiveness is absolutely necessary. You do need to shut yourself off from a winter storm or the desert heat. And in the tropics in Bali here, we want the chance to seal ourselves off and protect ourselves in some spaces. But we have a pretty comfortable, moderate situation some of the time and we want to feel that breeze. We don't want to miss it. And I've also wonder about what we give up in our industrial world of mechanization. We've given up on texture in our pursuit of perfection and flat surfaces and quality control. And I wonder if it's not actually the easiest, most economical, most efficient thing to make everything flat and smooth and right angled and polished. It's just how it's evolved in the construction world. But that texture of the floor, I believe that it can give us so much that it can ground us. It can give us a sense of closeness to the world around us and to each other. I wonder about the first steps of life on this warm and textured wood. What does that do to a person? How does it wire your mind or even the first step of your day in the morning? There's an element of mystery to the future, of adventure, of being in a new space that makes something new possible in ourselves. And we've all found ourselves stretching the limits of health and safety lately to be close to the people that we love. And to be close to people that we wanna be close to, we also have to consider the spaces around us and our relationship with them and our relationship with nature being designers and builders and makers and creators in the world. Because it's just time that we remembered that we are nature and it's in our hands to create our future memories, design our future experiences and invent our future selves. A child drew this after living in a house that we built, Trauma Springs for some time. And it just remind me, reminded me of that sense of creating the world and capturing the world in our memories. And there is a whole new world of possibility out there in the future, a world where we can really feel that we belong. Thank you. So thank you, Elora, for your presentation. Thank you. It's really amazing the connection you have with the material on Bali, especially. We can see you really have a deep connection with, with the place and the, and the material. So I'm going to move on for some questions on the audience. Yes, <laughs> the first row. So just a little bit for the microphone. Um, hi, Laura. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It's a pleasure to hear you. I, I've been to the Green School, so ah. it's really exciting to... <laughs> I've been to Bali a few times and I saw a few projects and I'm really passionate about the material and the way you build things. And you can see you really love what you do and it, there's a story behind. And I've been to Bali and I love Bali as well, so I can understand you in some way. Um, I want to talk about something in sustainability that is not just architecture, um, because it's not involving only that. Uh, sustainability is a little bit more than the construction and what is amazing what you do. And I saw that these projects give uh, a lot of people work, so it's something very important, I believe, for you as well, that Balinese people can work in this structure. I think you could not do it without them. But no. for some reason, I was... Uh, a little bit sad when I went to the green school and I saw that Balinese people are not allowed. Well, they're not, it's not that they are not allowed, but they cannot study in this school. It was only a school for rich people. And my question was, how do you see this in the future that Balinese people are not able to go into your projects because they are part of it? Um, the disparity of the economy structure is a thing. And 
the nature of uh, Green School being an international school and in hiring, attracting teachers from around the world at international level salaries, I think has re required their business model to have a certain level of tuition that is connected with that rather than to what they wish and hope that they could provide in the community. But they also made a very strong commitment early on to have a scholarship fund. They're one of the few schools that I know on the island that has a Balinese scholarship fund. And part of what's made that possible is um, visitors from around the world, not certainly in the past few years, but for the first um, 10 years of Green School, the amazing attention from around the world of people just wanting to come and see the structures and understand a little bit about the educational systems and see this model, because what it really what it is, Green School is, it's a seed of possibility for the future both for me and my pursuit of the, um, of the design and architectural spaces. It's been the seed of a whole new vocabulary of design and construction, but also in education, the possibilities there have really inspired so many. So it is a, it's a laboratory, it's a model, it's an example. And um, people coming to tour, when people are able to come to Bali again, come and tour the green school because the, the funds from the touring go toward the Balinese scholarship fund. And in, within each class, there are one or several students who are from local communities, from Balinese families, who could absolutely not otherwise afford to, to pay any school when a local public school is available, but are having the chance to be part of this more international conversation and, um, and learn English and be open to other, other possibilities in the world. And what we're seeing with those kids and with many kids from many parts of the world is there is a surprising level of leadership. We're seeing kids really step up and take, on, take it personally, take the situation in the world personally and create possibilities and create businesses or uh, foundations or become speakers. Um, if you look up there, if you look it up, there is like green school students with TED talks and all sorts of incredible things. So it's just a little tiny part of the world, a little tiny example in the world, but it's a seed that's allowing something amazing to grow. And I'm really proud to be part of it. So, any more questions, more questions in the audience? No. Anna? I have a question. Uh, we saw big structures made with, built with bamboo. Does bamboo have uh, construction limitations? Yeah. Well, how do you deal with the limitations? Yeah. I mean, everything has limitations, um, but bamboo has very particular ones that have ruled it out for many people in the past from considering taking it seriously to build permanent structures with it. Bamboo is pervasive across Bali, Indonesia, Asia, and all tropical regions in the world, and even some tropical re regions. Just about every continent grows some kind of species of bamboo. And many of them have varying different possibilities, strengths, and uses. And many of them are used in, 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 um, in their regions for things usually that are short-term use. Um, and very few things that have ever been made out of bamboo in the history of the world have survived to this day. There are probably islands, even continents that were first reached by bamboo rafts. Um, and we see that in Bali. If you walk down a village road in Bali, if you walk into a, into a shop, you'll see so many items of daily use that are made out of bamboo. Some of those have been, since been replaced by plastic, unfortunately, but many are still um, very useful in bamboo. So people will be born on a bamboo mat, um, get married in a bamboo um, decorative arrangement. They will. Uh, their cremation pyre will be built out of bamboo and the whole life cycle is connected with this material. But because of its vulnerabilities, it was not taken seriously for permanent construction use. The difference came over the past couple decades when reliable, safe and natural treatment solutions were found simply to replace the sugar in the bamboo with a salt that prevented insects from, from seeking the sugar, from eating it. So we now have properly treated bamboo that is safely produced. And that allows us to build permanent structures. But if we follow other sort of design models of architecture in building those structures, we will get very frustrated because of the irregular and round and tapering nature of the poles, but also because if overly exposed to UV and water, the bamboo will not last long. Um, you will see cracking and fading bamboo in structures in places where it doesn't have adequate roof overhang. So our entire design style is connected in with the limitations of this material. It's vulnerability to overexposure to humidity and water um, and also to, to UV. So it's our responsibility as, responsibility as designers to let go of our hopes and dreams and our imagination and focus on the reality of how to best position and protect this material in everything that we do. 
Maybe you could talk a little bit more about this protection methods because yesterday we had Lin Lin Feng and he told us that bamboo was only good for about five years if you used it without protection. That was really a, yeah. a concern he had. So how do you deal with it? Because well, clearly our constructions are more than five years and they are made to last a lot more than five years. So how do you prepare this in the process and in the construction also? How, how do you solve this problem? Well, it has to be properly treated, as I mentioned. You have to replace the salt, the sugars in the fiber with salt. Um, that needs to happen before you build. After you build, you have to coat it, put protective coatings as you would with wood. Wood also gets vulnerable and disintegrates depending on the type when it's overexposed. So you have to do that. But the most important thing is creating, I mean, many of our structures lean outward and have a roof overhang. This is very suitable and common in the tropics because of the, um, the way that that provides shaded verandas and comfortable places for this kind of weather. But it is also very specifically and intentionally done to protect the structural poles from rain. When you have the, the angle of the poles and then the roof overhang, you have much less exposure to rain and UV. And so that is really at the core of what we do. And many bamboo structures that we see out there in the world, we are concerned for them um, if that isn't properly addressed. and. Um, we see, all, I, 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 I feel like there's a sense of design enthusiasm and maybe even ego that provokes people to just wanna build what they want without considering for that. But it is, um, it's essential to, otherwise your building will last for five years or 10 years. Whereas a properly designed and treated um, bamboo building should last as long as a properly designed and treated wooden building, which as we know from the cities of Europe and some in Asia is potentially centuries. Perfect. So, any more questions in the audience? There? Oh, yeah, we have one question here. Just a little bit. Okay. Uh, pode fazer no micro, que só não conseguimos ouvir. Sim, pode, pode falar. A minha dúvida é como ela encaixa essa atmosfera natural numa cidade consolidada? Como, como por exemplo, ela mostrou no master plan do México, como, qual seria o elemento de transição entre uma cidade urbana e um, uma atmosfera totalmente natural, com árvores e lagos e Ok, vamos tentar. <laughs> so, Elmara, I will try to translate it. Uh, the question is, uh, of course, your buildings are very um, nature-based, and how do you do this transition to a more urban context? where clearly it's, it's, it's another uh, approach for the, for the material and how, um, yeah, how do you solve this uh, Contra connection? Yeah, the, the contrast of, of context, yeah. Um, to date, our buildings have been designed very often to be in rural settings, in jungle settings, in village settings. Um, the ones, the projects that we've done in cities have mostly been interior design projects. And that is um, often for the simple fact that if you create um, any building, you need a building code that is tied in with the, with the location and cities usually have um, very strong building codes that do not yet understand and have not studied and have not measured bamboo to be able to assess whether or not it is suitable in what way. But this is starting to change. And over the coming decade, um, you're already seeing timber skyscrapers or multi-story wooden timber buildings out of laminate timber usually. There are a lot of factors that they have to address and deal with in that, such as the fire code um, and of course the engineering. But that has already, we already see that happening. Bamboo is, um, is beautifully expressed in many of our designs in its original pole form, but is much more widely applicable and will be seen much more in the future in a similar way that you see laminate timber um, sliced up and glued together with various types of glues. Um, and that is a way to create much more consistency while expressing the flexibility of the fibers um, but the consistency is essential for the engineering and for the coding departments and to be able to absolutely measure and, and you can't have individually unique pieces if you're trying to have this level of precision. So in the coming decade, we will see um, much more than the, the IKEA chopping boards and, and bamboo laminate flooring that you might already have in your house. We'll see far beyond that into structural systems as well. Um, we don't currently have any projects. We haven't been engaged to tackle such a challenge. It would be a privilege too. Whereas design studio that works on each project case by case as our clients have the confidence to engage us to do so. But we did have a theoretical project with a, um, 
with an engineer in London who wanted to incorporate, propo propose to incorporate bamboo poles in a structure as a renovation. So this was a, a, a high rise that was built with steel and concrete, but they wanted to expand it. And he thought that that would be a nice avenue to introduce the possibility of the material in a way that would be semi-structural, but there was other components of the building doing the requirements of the building code because it has to be step-by-step step in terms of getting it, getting the material understood and measured enough to be accepted. Yeah, I that's a common point on these natural materials that well, obviously the countries are not prepared for these uh, materials and the legislation and the, the um, permits. So we'll need to push forward and that's why we're here today. You know? <laughs> so more questions in the audience? Uh, here? One more here? Oh, no. <laughs> here. Ah, uh, yeah, here. Hi, Eleonora. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, are you here? Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much for your presentation. As I understood, you have our architecture studio, but also like a construction uh, company because you, because the material that you use is, you have to reinvent the way you, you build in order to achieve um, this kind of spaces. And my question is, how do you um, build uh, outside of Bali? Um, do, you, do you go with your team or do you train people outside Bali? Um, that's my question. Great. So um, we, in the beginning, 12 years ago, when I joined the team and started to lead the team, we absolutely had to be a one-stop shop of design and construction. And usually we had to commit to a price for the finished thing before we had even been able to start designing it in order to gain the confidence in those early days um, to be able to go forward on projects. So we really were responsible for um, the entire cycle. Uh, we weren't doing forestry, but we were, we were buying bamboo timber from individual farmers and taking it all the way through to the finished product, including much of the interior design and um, detailing. And um, in, the past, in the past 10 years, um, the interest in bamboo around the world has increased a lot. And there are many, many more teams in the world who are already working in bamboo in small ways. Um, some of them are seeded by a course that my brother um, created and that I help him teach at, with my team, which is called Bamboo U. So Bamboo U attracted up to 40 people at a time several times a year to Bali to do an intensive course that took us, took people through the whole cycle of bamboo, including, um, including forestry and through its design. And so there has been a lot of education and a lot of community building and conversation in the world about bamboo. And what this has created in terms of possibility for us is that we've now been able to separate the design studio from the construction um, and, and workshop, which gives each the freedom to work on other kinds of jobs. So as a design studio now, many of our jobs are overseas. And um, when we are approaching that, we are, especially during COVID, less likely to be able to send teams of Balinese craftsmen to do trainings, for example, and more likely to need to understand the level of skill available in that place, how we can stretch it a little bit through the way that we prescribe the design, and then to design into that, also combining other materials. Because We've um, just been really honored and excited to recently be attracting clients who are less concerned with the fact that we are using bamboo and it must all be bamboo. And they are more interested in the kind of spaces that we create and the kind of feeling that we evoke through those spaces. And they give us license to assess their location, um, connect with all kinds of different craftsmen and material types and techniques and technologies and to then propose what the building should be made out of. And very often that incorporates some bamboo. If at very least it incorporates some bamboo things that we create here in Bali in the workshop and ship by container to them um, because the carbon footprint of that is quite drastically below um, anything else that requires fossil fuel even when you ship it around the world. So we're able to do a little bit of that and really show off the incredible artistry of the Balinese craftsmen which we rely on so much um, while having a broader palette and creating the experience. But there are teams that we are just excited to work with um, who have um, some degree of bamboo skill or amazing bamboo skill in different ways than we developed in Bali. 
So it is a, a much bigger conversation. It's a community and it's a collaboration that allows us to, um, to work on many other kinds of exciting jobs now. Great. Thank so, you. More questions? More questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. One yeah. on the back. On the back. Hello, Elora. Hello. So, <laughs> hello. So, um, I would like to ask you in the some of the projects you've shown us, um, what kind of material do you use on the roofs? Because it seems a natural material, and I'd mm. like to know which one it is. Um, originally, traditionally, we did a few buildings that were made with thatch, which is a beautiful way of insulating a building in the tropics. It it has. Um, a cooler temperature in the interior of the building. It's obviously a very natural resource. Um, it's a grass that grows on the hills. And um, it also is nice during a rainstorm. It's a nice buffered sound. However, thatch in Bali has not been um, reliable for long-term use. It might previously last 10 or 20 years. It now lasts three to five because of the way that they put fertilizer on it and process it. So thatch stopped in, in addition to being a fire hazard. So thatch stopped being an option that, that very many people would consider. And then we began using um, a roof that was uh, had a membrane surface. At first we were using aluminum and then we, later we've developed, uh, innovated with different kinds of membranes, conventional materials, and then coated it, um, applied on top of it, a layer of flattened bamboo shingles. And those flattened shingles have a lifespan of maybe seven to 10 years, and they do need to be replaced, but the membrane under it has the potential to last much longer. Um, so that has been something that we've used a lot over the past decade. More recently, we've started using um, the outer layer being copper, which is um, recyclable at least, and has a much longer lifespan and a very beautiful, um, very beautiful appearance especially in the hands of the Balinese craftsmen. Um, so we have recently been exploring that. And in projects around the world, it's really a matter of looking at what is suitable um, in each location and what is appropriate in each location. The, um, the, the main constraint that we've had that limits what kinds of materials we can use is in the, is in the form of the building. When you have a curving roof, it really limits um, which kinds of roofing materials you can rely on. And what we haven't done yet, but really want to do next is like earth roofs, um, roofs that have layers of clay and earth on top of them, because that would also be um, a nice insulator and a more natural feeling. Perfect. More questions? So, no. no. Uh, if I have a question. In fact, it's more a curiosity. Uh, you draw to Donna Karen. Uh, do you think that uh, influence your architecture? Oh, yes. Working How? for Donna Karen was something that I didn't expect. Um, it was work. It, it was very resonant with my experience of fine arts school and a sense of a, a fine arts conversation different than what I would have imagined would be the case in a fashion industry situation. Um, fashion is obviously an art. But, um, but I didn't anticipate how she had this sense of um, artistic expression and intuition that connected so much, uh, especially among many designers in the world, is really known for coming to terms with the curves of a woman, woman's body and, and really making women feel good in their clothes physically, just to feel held and draped and wrapped. So we would watch her in the studio taking a different kind of incredible Italian silk jersey and just wrapping it around herself and snuggling up into it and revealing some shoulder and, and seeing what it, how it would look if it was draping in a certain way. And she was just a master of drapery. And so I very much feel that that's our responsibility and that's our, our chance to do with a building is to drape it around a person, to make you feel like you're wearing um, a building that feels like your, your next layer of skin and it empowers you. Donna's, Donna's women always felt like empowered while being feminine. Um, so that's something that, that we really seek to do, um, that I seek to do as a woman is to how do, I, how do I be in charge? How do I, 
how do I self-express? How do I have confidence to do so while also feeling like I'm doing that naturally and not fitting into the shoes of a, any sort of male template, um, which is the templates that we have in the world because of um, how the past few thousand years have gone. So I learned so much from her in, in all the realms of identity, of space making, of, of um, feeling, of intuiting. Um, it's absolutely connected. Thank you. So, Elora, we know it's quite late in Baldi now, so I think we finish here and let you rest. Thank you very much for being with us and to share your uh, context and experience with the audience. And we hope to, to be with you in the future again. So thank you very much. Thank you, Elora. Bye. It's an honor. Thank you very much. Come visit us in Bali once you can. <laughs> sure. <Okay. laughs>